Welcome back. <laughs> Could we do it like that? That's weird. <laughs> all right. Um, I, I hope that uh, you all are having a good time. Uh, the, the, the conference, I, I believe, has already been an absolute success. If we ended it right now, I think that we would actually have some good amount of material to go ahead and move forward. But we're not done yet. We have a lot of material to go through still. Um, and again, the hope is by the end of Sunday, you have some framework. You have a, a good amount of chunk to, to deal with in order to be able to uh, develop further understandings concerning what the kingdom is. Before we begin, I, wanna re I just want to quick redress. Um, and we've talked about this uh, individually at times, but just for people's sake online, that uh, 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 last night I addressed it and then John addressed it. We, um, there's several people within our camp, Andy Woods' example, uh, to Saint, various individuals who I consider friends, uh, who I trust hermeneutically, um, are just a little bit uh, in, in a small disagreement, not theologically, but interpretationally, concerning what is this kingdom of, he of the heavens. Is it a kingdom that is in heaven that comes down to earth, or is it a king of the heavens who comes down to earth and establishes a kingdom. And which I said last night, and, I, I, and John said earlier today, it's largely semantical. Whatever one it is, okay, you know, if you, if you want to hold on to that concept, um, it's just using the verses that most people use, I have a little bit of a question about. The one thing that we hold to, all of us hold to, that are, that are understanding this not yet, not the already not yet, but the not yet kingdom, that we're not in a kingdom, is that we are not a spiritual kingdom. We're not in a kingdom. We're not, we're not building a kingdom. We're not increasing the kingdom. We're not, we're not uh, imposing a kingdom. So that is not where we are. And we all agree theologically that that's, that's accurate, that we are not Israel. We're not true Israel. We're not Israelis at all. Now, if you're, if you're a Jew, then you're Israel and the church. That's fine, like Eric. But we, as a church, are not the true Israel. We are not in an allegorical messianic area, uh, era. Sorry, uh, uh, an allegorical messianic era. The church and believers are not under a covenant. Some people agree, disagree. Uh, that's where we are currently in this body. Uh, as far as the elders go, we've talked about this, that we're not a covenant. Um, we are, have promises, but and some people say, well, that's semantical too. Okay. But if you're going to use the typical word for covenant, which there is a word for covenant, both in Greek and in Hebrew, the church is not under a covenant. We have promises, not a covenant. Um, and finally, the kingdom belongs to Jesus Christ, but the nation that He will rule through is Israel. You can't get away from that. All right? So we're all, we are all in agreement on those terms. Slightly wording, some, some semantical ideas, but when we get into our heads, us, you know, um, theologians, if you will, people who think about this for a living, we get into semantics. We get into wordplay. What are we really saying here, and how are we going to convey this information? So far, three lessons in, I hope you have seen that, the, that the, how you view the kingdom has a definite impact upon how you actually deal with the Bible hermeneutically. Hermeneutics, how you understand the Bible, goes both ways. If you have a literal, consistent, grammatical structure, understanding of, of the text, I believe you come out on one end dealing with the kingdom. Also, if you have a kingdom understanding that is, oh, we're in the kingdom now or the already not yet, you have to go back into the text and alter the way that you look at the text. So it goes back and forth. You have to be very careful and make sure that you do not force your ideas of the kingdom upon the text. You let it speak for itself. And of course, there's a theological impact that we're dealing with. How we view the kingdom and how we view God's promises to Israel, the covenants He's made with Israel concerning the kingdom, will impact how we view God, even if you don't think it does. A lot of people say, oh, that doesn't change my view of God about being a promise keeper. It has to. And we'll see that more and more as we move forward. This particular lesson is on the characteristics of the restored Israeli kingdom. Now, um, again, overlap. 
right? We're going to have overlap. We're going to be talking about similar verses. We're going to be dealing with uh, texts that we've kind of read already before, but we have to make sure we do our due diligence and understand exactly what is happening within Scripture concerning the kingdom. And, oh, by the way, we're not going to answer all the debates, not even close. People who have questions and continue to have questions, uh, I'm, I'm filtering them now, and if you want to give them to me, I will do my best to answer them over time. Uh, specifically next uh, Sunday, Luther will be out of town, so I will have the 9 o'clock again, and I will do a redress over some of the questions that people have already posed to me. So if you have questions and you don't want to ask them out loud, well, give them to me in writing, and I'll see if it's, uh, I can fit it into a 45-minute question and answer session. To begin this particular lesson, we have to start somewhere. Almost always, right? So why not start in Acts 1.6? Acts 1 6 says, So when they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? Sounds like an interesting question. You ought to see the commentaries on this verse, right? To do that, let's go ahead and turn back to Acts and just make a few observations in dealing with this particular text. Acts chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 1, because where did the question come from, and why would they ask this question? And then how did Jesus respond? So Luke starts out saying, the first account I composed, that's basically the book, the book of Luke, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. To these he also presented by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but wait for the Father who had promised, which he said, you heard from me, that John baptized with water, but you will be baptized from the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, when they had come together, they were asking him, Lord, is it at this time you're restoring your kingdom in Israel? And that is, a fast, again, an absolutely fascinating question. You, the dance that you see people go through this particular question is amazing. Here's a couple observations, though. After spending three years with Jesus, which He had daily personal instruction with them, including 40 days in His company following the resurrection, also learning about the kingdom of God, the disciples are what? They're eager for Jesus to establish His kingdom and restore Israel. He does, they don't say, Jesus, we're so excited. Can we go now and start building your kingdom? They don't own it. They've learned from this guy for three years. They spent 40, years with the resur 40 days with the resurrected Jesus, and they said, are you at this time, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? Not are we restoring the kingdom to Israel. How do we go about restoring this kingdom? Are you doing it? What was Jesus' response? Acts chapter 1, verse 6 and verse 7, he says, so when they, after they asked him the question, he answered them and said, it is not for you to know the times or epochs which the Father had fixed by his own authority. So what is Jesus' response in this question? Basically, stop concerning yourself about the when. He doesn't say, oh, don't you know that you're building it now? Don't you know we've already started? We already have a population for the kingdom? And you're to go through all of Jerusalem and Samaria and, and all the locations building the kingdom. That's what the kingdom is now. He says, it's not for you to know. Well, if it's now, then why does he tell you it's now? He says, it's not for you to know. Many who believe that the kingdom of God is spiritual, not physical, and does not pertain to Israel at all, must work around this verse. Some even say that sim Jesus simply ignores the question as a demonstration of their ignorance. Ah, you know what? I've had enough with you guys. Three years and 40 days, I'm done. You don't get it. Just wait for the Holy Spirit, then you'll figure it out. He, no, He answers the question. But notice that Jesus does not 
say anything contrary to their question except for the fact about the timing. That's all. He has no problem telling them that they're ignorant other places. But that is not Jesus' response. The question in Acts 1-6 implies understanding in the future establishment of the messianic kingdom on earth and all the prophets attested to this fact. The kingdom will be established by Jesus and administered by Jesus and the apostles. And they looked forward to these promises with eagerness. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you that you who have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man sits on His glorious throne, you shall also sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. He's dealing with Israelites. He's dealing with the Jews. He's dealing with the twelve. One leaves and one's replaced. But He says, you're going to help me administer this, this, new, this kingdom rule when I come into my glorious throne. And when will that be? Matthew 25, verse 31, the future rule will happen at the second coming of Jesus contrasted with that belief that He is currently in a mystical kingdom. He is not saying, I'm in my glorious throne now. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. He is not sitting... Now, he's sitting when he comes back. These are just simply two concepts that we have to understand. And I'm going to say something a little mean, right? As you said before, they're not here to defend themselves, but I'm going to say something mean anyway. If someone states that they are a Christian, I don't deny that. I think there are plenty of people who have a really bad, bad view of eschatology that may actually be believers, that have a bad understanding. But they do not believe that Jesus will literally reign on the earth, and that reign will be a, through a restored Israeli kingdom. Then they do not take the Bible literally or seriously. They read it as kind of like a moralistic concept, and they like Jesus a lot. They, they, they love them some, some, some Jesus. But when they read the prophecies, they go, ah, not really. They don't take it literally. They don't take it seriously. And that's a problem. To them, everything is allegory. The only reality is what is from their face. This is reality right here. I'm dealing with America. That is my reality. And therefore, I have to view the kingdom through my current situation. This is what's important to them. They view the promises of God through the spectrum of human experience. They, they, because they have no evidence of a supernatural circumstance, they deny its existence in the actual physical plane. They have no problem going to heaven and experiencing a spirit, supernatural experience then, but not here. Because Why? Because they don't see it. They view the promises of God through a spectrum of human experience while claiming to believe in a supernatural God. Why is it so far-fetched that if God created the heavens and the earth, that God created, had a flood, that God uh, gave us a man who is God in the flesh and died for sins and that atonement pays for our sins, why is it so far-fetched to think that Jesus Christ will literally return, take His throne, and rule this earth through Israel. Why is that so hard? Remember our, my, my very first presentation on the introduction. We're trying to untangle the web we have woven. Christians did this. Christians made it a mess. They bundled, they, they crunched it up and said, ah, you know, all the way back, I, I didn't even realize how far back it went when Luther's presentation. And it went back all the way to the, to the second century, even late first century, that we're dealing with people who go, ah, it can't be Israel, and so therefore, we're the kingdom. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, I understand that 1,300 years later, maybe you start going and questioning this concept, but really, that soon? You can't see the, 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 the miraculous power of God to be able to pull back His own people back into a nation and then rule through them? I don't understand. All right. So, that being said... 
let's talk about what this particular topic is, and that is the restored, the restored Israeli kingdom, the promise of restoration. Now, this goes back, and, and Luther touched on that, goes, um, goes back all the way to Jeremiah 31. And so now that you're in Acts, go back to Jeremiah 31, and we have to start there. And I'm sure that Luther's going to be talking about this at 9.30 tomorrow. But I'm not going to go deal with all the different covenants. I'm dealing with one and all the different aspects of that covenant. Because the restored Israeli kingdom through the lens of the new covenant, that's the idea that we're dealing with. Because if you're going to deal with what it's going to look like, you have to deal with the, all the passages that, that explain what God is going to do with Israel in the future. We're going to read through many verses. I hope you have your Bibles or your thumbs if you have a phone. Or write it down as I'm going to have the, most of the texts up here on the screen anyway. And we're going to read through these texts, make some simple observations, and then outline the concepts of the promises made to Israel. All right? So we're going to read and then make some observations. Let's start in Jeremiah 31, starting in verse 31, going through the verse 34. See, I didn't touch 35 through 37. I left that for you. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. They will not teach again, each man his neighbor, each man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and their sin I will remember no more. Now, we're going to come back here. So mark it. Put a bookmark in there. Hold your hand there if you want. That doesn't ever works for me. Do what you need to do because we're coming back here shortly. But I want to go through some very important passages elsewhere within the prophets. Now, we're, going, we're not going to even go to Joel, Amos, Zechariah. They have a ton of information. But if we try to detail it all out, we'll get lost. So we're going to stick with Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. So let's have some fun. Let's turn over to Isaiah chapter 1. Two verses here. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Then... I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. After that, you will be called the city of righteousness, a faithful city. Zion will be redeemed with justice, and her repentant ones with righteousness. So, quick observation, okay? What will God do to Israel? Now, this is in the midst of basically... Punishment. After judgment, then I will restore your judges. That means that God is going to restore the theocratic justice system that he had from the law. That you will appoint judges. This is what he told Moses. You will appoint judges and counselors, and they will decide based upon my law what is being done now. Now, here's a question I have for you. I love Israel, 1948, miraculous, and I do believe that these are the building blocks for this new restored kingdom. However, the current Israel is not this. Okay? They're, they're not ruling in accordance with the law. The only thing they really hold to is El Al cannot fly in on Saturday. And they basically close all their stores on Saturday. The Sabbath is huge for them. Right? but they don't mandate all the different concepts. They, they, you can buy pork there. It's frowned upon, but they, they, have pork, they have it there. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. We know this very well, a Christmas verse. For, the, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, 
And His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of His government or of peace. On the throne of David or over His kingdom, to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Now, let's go ahead and make some observations. What are we talking about here? What are the promises dealing with this restoration idea of Israel? That there will be one who will sit on the throne of David, who will establish peace and justice. An individual, not a government, not a, not, not a parliamentary, a king. Whose king? Israel's king. Sitting on what? David's throne. They don't have, they don't have a monarchy currently in Israel. Isaiah chapter 10, verses 20 through 22. Now in that day, the remnant, oh, now we're getting into some other di different ideas, the remnant of Israel and those of the house of Jacob who have escaped will never again rely on the one who struck them, but they will truly rely on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. A remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, may be like the sand of the sea, only a remnant within them will return. A destruction is determined, overflowing with righteousness. See, this is, this is where it kind of gets yay, but scary, right? God is telling Israel, you're going to have a huge population, but at the end when it's done and we restore Israel, there will only be a small amount of you remaining. Now, how much is that small amount? Now, right now, there's millions of Jews throughout the world. There's millions of population within Israel who are Israeli. How many of them will make it? I, I, I don't know. But for us to think that these promises are to the church, this is, really? Although the church may be the sand of the sea, only a remnant will actually make it into righteousness. What? If you make this spiritual, a spiritual kingdom and spiritual promises, there's, a, there's issues here. I hope you see that. Isaiah chapter 55, so turn over there. Only one verse here, verse 3. Again, talking to Israel. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. What is this covenant, this everlasting covenant based upon? It's, it's echoed in Jeremiah 31. It's shown to Israel through the agency of David, through his line. Isaiah 59, verse 21. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your offspring nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. This is basically this reiterating Jeremiah 31, where I will write the law upon their heart, and they will not have to teach each other. That what God puts upon them and within them, they will, their offspring will have it automatically. Isaiah chapter 60 Verses 5 through 7, then 10 through 15. Okay, so we're going to skip around a little bit here. Starting in verse 5, Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. 
a, a multitude of camels will cover you. I don't know what that means. But evidently, it's really good. The young camels from Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense and will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. All the flocks of Kedar will gather to you. The rams of Nebaloth will minister to you. They will go up with acceptance on my altar and I shall glorify my glorious house. What's happening here? Israel will be honored amongst all the nations. Now, again, I'll, I'm, I'm kind of spoiling my own thunder here, but let me ask you a question. Is Israel honored amongst all the nations currently? They are hated, despised. Many countries have in their charter hey, we're going to go ahead and have this and that and all kinds of, you know, or we're going to love our people and have these laws and we're going to destroy Israel. And then, you know, I'm going, what? <laughs> this is part of their charter. And not just, not just a couple of the charters like Hamas, right? Not just Palestine, but Iraq, Iran, Jordan. They hate them. They're not bringing any glory into Israel. They despise Israel. Verse 10. Foreigners will build up your walls, and their kings will minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, and in my favor I have had compassion upon you. Your gates will be open continually. They will not be closed day or night, so that men may bring you the wealth of the nations with their kings led in procession. For the nation and the kingdom which will not serve you will perish." and the nations will be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the box tree, the cypress together the beautify, the, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I shall make the place of my feet glorious. The sons of those who afflicted you will come bowing to you, and those who despise you will bow themselves to the soles of your feet, and they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel." Whereas you have been forsaken and hated with one passing through, I will make you an everlasting pride, a joy from generation to generation. Restoration of Israel. My goodness, can you imagine every single nation paying homage to the, to the kingdom of Israel and her king, continually bringing in the wealth of the nations, I didn't, I didn't continue reading in verse 16. Yeah, it's weird. You will also suck the milk of nations and suck the breast of kings. I'm like, ah, that's a little... I, you know. <laughs> I know what it means, but it just sounds a little weird. Can you picture this? What this means for Israel. Hated and despised since its inception. Constantly under the foot. Not only because of the, the Gentiles, but also their own doing. Right? But God is going to restore them to such prominence that we can't even imagine why this small little nation is going to demand this kind of respect. And to say that this is going to happen naturally is silly. And to then say, oh, no, this is the church. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? It's, little, it's laughable, literally. Isaiah 61 for the Lord, for I, the Lord, love justice, in verse 8. I hate robbery in the burnt offering, and I will faithfully give the recompense and will make an everlasting covenant with them. Then their offspring will be known among the nations and their descendants in the midst of the peoples. All who see them will recognize them because they are offspring of the, the Lord is blessed. I mean, it's perpetual all the way through Isaiah, and I didn't read all of them. There's a ton of verses in Isaiah. Isaiah is doom and gloom, but then promise of restoration perpetually throughout the book, explaining to the people that even though I am going to discipline you and only a remnant will survive, when I come into my kingdom and I restore Israel, it will be the most glorious nation the world has ever known. Solomon would not hold a candle to it. 
So now, do you understand now when dealing with the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of God on earth and how this is going to look, why the, why the apostle would, is it now? What do you think they're thinking about? Do you think they're thinking about, oh, just, you know, hey, it's going to be nice here, you know, lying, laying down with the lamb and stuff. No, they're looking for this. Full restoration. And, and they're, they're going to be allowed to rule. They're going to be in a place of prominence in that kingdom. Would you want to be part of that now? Yes, please, now, God, now. I mean, how many times do we jump up and down and we'll open for the rapture? What do you think they were anticipating? All these promises of God and the Israeli kingdom. And what do you think they're anticipating in Acts chapter 1? Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He's there in His power, in His glory. Okay, are you doing it now? Um, see you later. It's not for you to know the time. And you can even almost hear the tears of Paul and Peter in their, second, in their final letters saying, it's my time of departure has come. And I'm not going to see this, but I, I, there will be a generation that will. Now turn to Jeremiah. Not 31, but 32. Jeremiah 32, verses 38 through 44. Jeremiah 32, verse 38, they shall be my people, and I will be their God. And I will give them one heart and one way, that they may fear me always, for their own good and for the good of their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good, and I will put the fear of, of me in their hearts so that they will not turn away from me. I will rejoice over them and do good and will faithfully plant them in this land with all my heart and with all my soul. For thus says the Lord, just as I brought all this great disaster upon this people, so I am going to bring on them all the good that I am promising them. Fields will it be uh, brought in this land of which you say, it is a desolation without man or beast. It is given to the hand of the Chaldeans. Men will buy fields for money, sign and seal deeds, and call in the wilderness the land of Benjamin, the, envy, the environs of Jerusalem, in the city of Judah, the cities of the hill country, the cities of the lowland, and the cities of the Negev, for I will restore their fortunes, declares the Lord. Complete, not just people restoration, not just people bringing in, but God is going to restore that land even in the Negev, the southern portion of Israel, which is basically desolate right now. The Negev will be fertile. Complete restoration of their fortunes, declares the Lord. Ezekiel 16. This is hard work, by the way. I get so excited about this stuff. I'm going, this is, this is, this is, this is, this is celebration. Remember how sometimes we, we end up with like really, really bummed out news. You know, you end up with a bad verse. You're going, yeah, and the Lord will destroy all of his enemies. You're like, oh, you know, this is fantastic. This is celebration. Nevertheless, in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 60, Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth. And I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you will remember your ways and be ashamed. And you will receive your sisters, both your older and your younger. And I will give them um, to you as your daughters, not because of your covenant. Thus, I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall know that I am the Lord, so that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation when I have forgiven you for all that you have done, the Lord God declares. God is basically going to, set, going to give them something so great that Israel will never, never again rebel. I'll say this now, I'll say it during the kind of the observations. Israel will not be on the side of Satan at the end of the thousand year reign. No. 
There's nothing. Everything says Israel will remain faithful. Ezekiel chapter 34. You'll start to recognize some of these verses. I will make, in verse 25, Ezekiel 34, verse 25, I will make a covenant of peace with them and eliminate harmful beasts from their land. Are you going to be allegorical or literal with this? Hmm. So that they may live securely in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I will make them an, an, a, I will make them an, a, the place around my hill a blessing, and I will cause showers to come down on their season, and there will be showers of blessing. Also the tree of the field will yield its fruit, and the earth will yield its increase, and they will be secure on the land. They will know that I am the Lord when I have broken the bars of their yoke and had delivered them from the hand of those who enslaved them. They will no longer be prey to the nations, and the beasts of the earth will not devour them, but they will live securely, and no one will make them afraid. I will establish them for a renowned planting place, and they will not again be victims of famine in the land, and they will not endure the insults of nations anymore. Then they will know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, the house of Israel, are my people, declares the Lord God. As for you, my sheep, the sheep of my pastures, you are men, and I am your God, declares the Lord God. Again, remember what I said at the beginning of this lesson. People who do not believe that God is going to reign on earth through Israel do not take the Bible literally or seriously. They read this, and what do they think? If they're a kingdom now, and this is the kingdom now, they can't take this literally or seriously. They go, ah, that there'll be, there'll be no dangerous beasts. How do you deal with that verse if you're thinking that the kingdom is now? Um, I think that Satan won't be able to touch me. I made that up, but I guarantee you it's in a commentary somewhere. Ezekiel 37. And then we'll make some, then we'll go ahead and, and recategorize and outline these observations for you. Ezekiel 37, verses 24 through 28. My servant David will be king over them, and they will have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinance and keep my statutes and observe them. They will live on the land that I give to Jacob, my servant, and your fathers lived, and they will live on it, they and their sons and their sons' sons forever. And David, my servant, will be their prince forever. I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people." And the nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. This, again, it's not all of them. I skipped several, in fact, ones that you would love to read again. Look them up. It's valuable, important information. But according to these texts, we can clearly see promises made to Israel and to Judah. Notice the language is consistent. We've read in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. These are not promises to the church. These are not covenants to the people who would believe after Israel rejects her Messiah. These are eschatological. These are end-time promises. So first and foremost, and that's weird. Let me, all of them are like this. You can't even read that, can you? Yeah, sort of? All right, I'll go roll with it. I was supposed to be black. 
on white, but it's white shadowed on white. Okay. We'll roll with it since you all said you can read it. <laughs> First and foremost, the covenant that, Jesus, that, that God is going to make with Judah and Israel is unconditional, involving God and a unified Israel. Judah and Israel back together, and God will be an unconditional covenant. It's not going to be like it was with their fathers. You know, let's go ahead and turn over to Jeremiah just so we can go ahead and continue to refer to this particular, particular passage, because I believe that Jeremiah 31 sums it up very well, but you have to take into consideration all the passages that deal with the covenants. Ezekiel's huge, Isaiah's huge, and various different passages in Jeremiah. And you can find various different ones and different characteristics, all right? But behold, days are coming, when declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, not like the covenant in verse 32, which I, took the, which I, which I made with their fathers, that when I took them out of the land of Egypt, that's the Sinaitic or the Mosaic covenant. But this covenant, which I will make with the house of Israel after those days in verse 33, okay, is going to be one that I put the, my law on their hearts. Unconditional, involving God and unified Israel. There, there's, it's no longer going to be, if you do this, then you get to stay. If you do that, then you get booted out again. That's what the old covenant was. This new covenant is made with Israel and Judah, concerning their future in that land. Now, based upon His grace and based upon what He does, they will never turn away from Him again. We see that throughout the text, but it's still an unconditional promise. Number two, let me double check something here because I think I did some changes here. Nope, nope, wait. Yeah, no well. This is a distinct this is distinct from the old covenant. If you read a lot of the um, the Jewish commentaries, the actual like the non-messianic Jewish, Jewish commentators, they read Matthew, they read Jeremiah 31 and all these different new covenant concepts and they go, "Oh, this is simply a repair of the old covenant. A forgiveness that you broke it, but you're going to return back to the old covenant." It's not an elaboration. It's not, he says I'm, that that's, it's a replacement. It's not a repair, but a repeal, replace. Notice, though, that this does not replace the law. The law is written on their hearts. The covenant is different. Remember, we talked about this. Did David break the law? Yes. Did he ever break the covenant? Not, it never say, it says that. He killed, he had adultery. I mean, there's some pretty bad stuff right from the Ten Commandments, right? But it never says that he broke the covenant. What was the covenant? You, you, are my God, I, that you are my people and I am your God. That's the covenant. Don't break that. Don't have any idols. Don't worship any other gods. When you break the law, you have sacrifices to restore that. But my covenant with them is you are my God and I am your people. Reverse that. You are my people and I am your God. That's the covenant. And they said, yes, we'll do that. And they didn't do that. Idol worship and worshiping other gods was the, was the failure of every major king that was called an evil king. Even Solomon, who started out fantastic, what had happened at the end? I'm sure he broke many laws, but when he went ahead and had his wives turn his heart and he started worshiping idols, he says, you broke my covenant. The only people who are called evil primarily were idol worshipers in Israel. And all the north were idol worshipers. Some in the south were not. This is dealing with the regeneration of Israel. Now, you have to understand the remnant are spiritually saved. This is not refer only to physical. This does refer to a spiritually saved Israel includes a national salvation as well. And the initial population of Israel during this restoration is called the remnant. Now, there's always a remnant. God promises that. No matter what time of the year it is, there's always Jews who believe in, there's always Jews who believe in God and in their Messiah, Jesus Christ. The last 2,000 years, there's always been saved Jews. Even during the worst parts of Israel's history, 
God tells him, don't worry, there are 5,000 people who have not bent the knee to Baal. So there's always a remnant, but this final, this final piece in the eschatological concepts dealing with this restoration, the initial population is called the remnant. Then they will repopulate Israel. In a thousand years of life, how many people, how many babies can they have? It's going to be a lot. That population is going to skyrocket. And again, I don't know how many they're starting with. 100,000, 1 million, 2 million, I don't know. It's ruled by the Son with justice on the throne of his father David. The Davidic throne is perpetually understood within this restoration of Israel, which we've contrasted. That's not what it is today. When, uh, when certain rabbis, and a lot of, there, there are certain rabbis online either doing talk shows or just, you know, question and answer through blogs, answer questions from Christians. What do you do with the Davidic line? And one of the answers, I think I have it written down somewhere else. Um, basically, I'll go ahead and summarize. I'm not, it's not a quote. Basically going, don't worry. He will be singled out, and we're not going to worry about the Davidic line. He'll figure that out himself. Why? Because they can't prove a Davidic line. So they're all worried. They're, they're, if they're messianic in any way, in other words, they're waiting for a Messiah coming, they're not, they're, they, they can't trace the Davidic line. He can't prove that. So basically, whoever God says is the Messiah, we're going to say he's Davidic line. So they still want it. They still desire it. Most Jews ignore it completely, that the Davidic line, the Davidic throne, is a euphemism for Israel in general. Number five, no need to evangelize their offspring or fellow Jews. It's fine. In Jeremiah, also in Isaiah 61, that their offsprings, offsprings, offspring, offspring will, will be completely fine. You know, to so, so many times, both in the Old Testament and also within our own experiences, you may be a great believer, you may be a great parent, and your kids turn out not, 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 not too great. Look at Samuel with his sons. David and his sons. I mean, even Solomon ended up failing at the end, but he was like number six out of, uh, like, many. <laughs> David had many much kids. During the millennial reign... No Jew, and this is basically how I take this, no Jew will be unsaved. The rebellion at the end of the thousand years will not involve Israel. The new covenant will take away their sins, and if you take it in context, it's the sin of breaking the old covenant. And I believe primarily in dealing with eschatological understanding, the rejection of the Messiah, that Israel, the nation, will be forgiven for their rejection of God. So this forgiveness of sins. The old covenant was not able to take away sins. So this is a full and complete forgiveness of the current rebellion and setting aside the rejection of the Messiah. Now that's paid for at the cross, which is beautiful because that's, you know, that's the inauguration. We talked about it before. The new covenant in His blood, he's a, it basically cuts the deal for the new covenant at the cross. But it's not realized yet. This is where some people call it an inaugural kingdom. Like, we're in the kingdom inaugurated, but not fully realized. That's an already not yet stance. Israel is not any... Which aspect that we've covered so far can you say is even remotely possible, is, is, is applicable to, the new, to, to where we are today? Only one. That's forgiveness of the sins. That's it. But you have to realize in context what he's forgiving. It's not a positional concept. We're going to learn about that in Matthew when we get that in chapter 6, right? And, and chapter 6, forgiveness has to be addressed because it's not always about a positional concept when it comes to the Jews. Number seven, my law on their hearts. No need to teach. 
So there, there's no need to evangelize, and also there's no need to teach anybody. Is it, does, this re, does this look any recognizable to you? Do we see this anywhere here today? What are we doing? If, if we're under the new covenant, and this is us, um, something wrong, you all must not be saved because you all need teaching. God will be personally involved with each person of Israel. I don't know what that's going to look like. I don't know how that's going to function. But man, Israel is going to be a very righteous nation. Interestingly enough, are there Gentiles involved? Now, I'm not talking about the glorified saints. We're going to be partakers in the kingdom. We'll come to Israel. We'll be ruling and reigning with Christ outside, outside of Israel. We're not Jews. So we're going to have responsibilities in other nations because there will be other nations. But interestingly, because my law will be on their hearts, I cannot find this applicable to Gentiles in the millennial reign. This will be applicable to who? Israel. So the other nations, ah, I, I, I can't see where these things are applicable to other nations during the millennial reign. How do I know that for certain? Because at the end of a thousand years, they rebel. All of these lessons dealing with the restoration of Israel deal with them never, ever forsaking God again. But the Gentile nations will. I was just musing a little bit. We can talk about that later. Number eight, full blessings of the earth, produce and beast. Jeremiah 32, Isaiah 61, Isaiah, Ezekiel 34. There's other passages. The lion will lay down the lamb or the wolf will lay down with the lamb. A, a child will lead a serpent by, its, by, by, a, by a leash. And going, yeah, that's cool. Is, is this just euphemism? Is this just allegorical understanding? No. Basically, it's kind of a... Uh, and, and because there's still sin in the world, but in Israel particularly, you can sleep outside and not worry about, you know, getting a bug bite and stinging and having to get an, an, an EpiPen. A wolf not going to just surround you and just kill you in your sleep. The, the wild beasts that harm you will be gone. There will be peace in that land. Now, will it, will it spill over? Probably. And I, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to really figure out exactly. Is there a peace line? You know, the lion gets aggressive once it goes too far south. I don't know. Um, but I, but I, the, at least in the picture of the restoration of Israel, all the promises to Israel within that land is that you will have complete peace and prosperity with both the field, that's all your produce, and the animals. That whole idea of going, come here, fish, it's going to do it. I, I don't, it's going to be cool. Israel will be the conduit for blessings upon all the nations. So not only will Israel get everything, you know, if, if Syria has some money or if, you know, Italy, if they're still around, Jordan, Egypt, all the nations, if there's whoever's around at that time, will bring their glory into Israel. And Israel, through Israel, Jesus Christ and Israel, will be the conduit for blessing upon all nations. If they honor Israel, they will be blessed and they will have abundance. If they withhold from Israel and do not honor Israel, they will have famine. And there will be lots of issues in the millennial reign. And we'll probably be there as emissaries of Jesus Christ going, I told you so. Not really, but maybe. And finally, again, one of the most important aspects in dealing with whether or not we're in the kingdom now, the temple will be rebuilt. His sanctuary will be rebuilt. He will sit on a literal throne in a, in a, in a temple that will be built at some point, a physical temple. And... Again, much to my amazement, you know, people saying nearly thousands of years ago going, the temple will never be rebuilt. Israel will never be a nation. They don't take the Bible literally or seriously. There are two main impacts that I want to emphasize from this study. First, for Israel. For Israel, an understanding of their future promises is invaluable. 
what happens when we as Gentiles go to the text, go to Jeremiah, go to Isaiah, go to Ezekiel, and go, that's mine. It's not for you. How do you think the Jews throughout history have thought about Christians who are trying to claim promises from the Old Testament that was specifically says for Judah and Israel? Do you not understand that Christianity over the, the years have put a bad stain, a bad taste in the mouth of Jews who we consistently claim for ourselves things that belong to them? Many non-believing Jews today disregard the Messianic, the eternal kingdom, and the Davidic covenants. We've, we've planted the seed so much they've given up on it. Now, they're responsible for their own belief. But throughout the ages, we told them it's not for you. Now, this is where I had that, 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 that um, um, information from David, uh, from David uh, Rosenfeld. Here's what he says concerning the line of David. We do not need to be concerned about how Messiah, son of David, will be identified. He'll be a prophet, second only to Moses. God himself will select him and appoint him to task. He himself, with divine inspiration, will resolve the other matters of Jewish lineage. Why? Because they've, 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 gotten, they've, 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 they've given up. In order for Jews, and this is, this is the message that we have for Israel, in order for Jews to survive the coming judgment, if they don't believe now, they need to at least have the, plant, the seed planted. In order for them to survive the coming judgment and enjoy the benefits outlined in this lesson, they need to come to terms with their Messiah King. They need that. Otherwise, they're not going to survive it. Now, if they, if they believe it now, they don't have to survive it because they won't be here. But the seed needs to be planted in Israel, and I think it has been effectively. But we need to be part of that as well for every generation. Number two, the character of God. God's grace and faithfulness is truly amazing and needs to be fully taught and pondered. If God can act faithfully toward Israel, then God truly is the epitome of love and grace. That nation for thousands of years, which has turned its back on the true God, served other gods, and even today is an unbelieving nation, God will still restore them. That is a God of grace. For us, we need to be consistent and not claim we are in the kingdom or in the new covenant. None of the characteristics, and, I, and I, we'll talk about the, the forgiveness of sins. That's the only one people cling to. But just because it's similar to our language and our positional understanding of who we are before Christ or in Christ before God does not mean it's mine. It does not mean I can go back and claim all of Jeremiah 31. To do so reduces God to making promises that are covert, secret, spiritual, mystical, and, or transferred to another. Plus, one of the most honest and effective critiques from the Jews is Gentile Christians claiming promises that are made to Judah and Israel. That's a solid critique. And we need to change that. We need to say, no, I'm sorry for Christianity over the years. That is not what we believe. That Jeremiah 31, that is for you and proclaim that truth. As believers, we have a lot to look forward to, and the grace to, of God to us is immeasurable. We will participate in the kingdom, and we'll talk about when, which way later, <laughs> and how we're going to be heirs of that kingdom. Yes, we are, but not in the way that Israel and Judah are. Why claim promises that are not ours? Will we as believers participate in that kingdom? Yes but not in accordance with Jeremiah 31. I hope this helps. And as it says at the end of Revelation, Jesus says, says to His people, says to John, He who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, come, Lord Jesus. And we look forward to that day. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for Your Word. that You've given us all things to look forward to. And we can go ahead and see your promises being made to Israel and the fulfillment of that promise within the context of Scripture. Even though we don't see it now, help us to understand it better so that we can proclaim your truth and be ministers of that new covenant to the people who need to hear it. We look forward to that day and we ask you to hasten it. 
At the same time, we thank you for your patience so that we have the opportunity to partakers with that gospel. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Anybody have any questions? All right. We'll say God bless, and I, I'm glad I was so effective. Take care. We have one half hour, so at 2.30 we'll, we'll do our final session.